Thanks, Paul, for those very generous remarks. And I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on which we, of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, my daughter, who's here this morning, spotted the program, and uh, she asked what a keynote was. And I said, "Oh, it's a session that you know everyone who's attending the conference is supposed to to, to go to." And her response to that was. Did you arrange that because you were worried that no one would show up? Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful uh, that uh, you have indeed uh, shown up this morning. Uh, thank you for that, and uh, I hope you uh, you won't be disappointed. And thank you also for the, the the very welcome invitation to speak here today. I participated in the last national conference uh, here in uh, two, I just checked with Paul 2013, and I remember it as a, a very happy occasion, and really delighted to be involved again. Um, on the 18th of September 1933, two businessmen from a Victorian country town arrived by ship in Melbourne, having recently visited Japan. Okay. Um, they seemed impressed by what they'd seen. There was, I quote, the beauty of the Japanese countryside, one of the men supposedly told a journalist from the Melbourne age. Although beauty was never sacrificed to utility, he added, at the same time, there was not the smallest proportion of land which was not cultivated. Vegetables grew even on railway banks, and chimneys were smoking throughout the big cities. The Japanese were hard-working and happy, and if this traveller is to be believed, uh, they'd reply politely and in perfect English if asked for directions. Apart from their courtesy, hospitality and intelligence, the outstanding characteristic of the Japanese was their extraordinary cleanliness. In this, as in every other way, they were a century ahead of every other Eastern race and ahead also of a great many white nations. It was a pity that those who criticised Japan, thought the traveller, had not visited that country to learn something of the outlook of the people as a whole. Now, why am I interested in this particular story? The two travellers mentioned in that article were my grandfather and great uncle. Car dealers of Nil. It was a beautiful Cadillac they imported in 1924, which made a recent appearance on the web. Um, and uh, they came from Nil, which is in, up in northwestern Victoria, a wheat district uh, 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 known as the, the Wimra. It was Uncle Tony, um, as he was known in the family, who was supposedly being interviewed. But the opinions I've just set out were not published as direct quotations, and it's a little difficult, I must say, to imagine an Italian migrant quite speaking in such a way. Moreover, it's noticeable that another report attributes a strikingly similar comment about vegetables and Japanese cleanliness to another man entirely, a Wimra grazier. So it's possible there was some confusion here about who had said what. Other reports have Uncle Tony waxing lyrical about the cheapness of various goods in Japan compared with Australia. I have to say that seems rather more like a member of my family and more like a migrant businessman on the make. Cheap labour is the secret, according to Mr Bongiorno. They work 10 or 12 hours a day, Sunday inclusive, with two or three days off a month. There are few unions in Japan. These are under government control and strikes are practically unknown. Clearly happy days for Tony. Um, now, this story hasn't been won through intensive family research. I found it by typing my family's name into Trove, haven't we all? Uh, it's the kind of thing pretty much anyone can do, including students in schools and in universities. But of course, if that's all there was to research in history, it wouldn't be worth teaching the subject. History is all about context and meaning, and I don't need to, to, to say such a thing to an audience like this. The millions of fragments that, might, um, that one might pick up through things like Trove, and there are many other databases uh, of a similar nature, if not quite on that scale, um, I think that only makes sense in the context of questions we might ask about the past, about how and why things happened the way they did, um, and what this might mean for an understanding of other people's worlds and their world's relationship with our own. Indeed, even our ability to locate research materials on a database such as this one does require some level of background or contextual detail. I needed to be able to recognise my relatives 
I had to know a little of the family history to enjoy the surprise, and it was in indeed a surprise, that my relatives travelled to Japan in 1933. If my own students are using a newspaper to explore some aspect of Australian history, say political history, they need to know something of the newspaper's purposes um, and possibly something of its politics if they're going to be able to make sense of how it frames the news, if they're going to be able to fully understand why it offers certain types of opinions on the issues of the day. And there are other complications too. Um, if my students are exploring, say, attitudes to contraception in the 1930s, and I've had students doing that, they're not going to get very far um, if they type the word contraception into trove for that period. They need to know the terminology of the day, that a preventative is what we now call a contraceptive. And, of course, to get very far with any primary source, we need to be aware of the meaning of words and phrases and they, the way they change across time, that figures of speech in common use in the past have now disappeared. I always loved that one I'd come across in the late 19th century when someone died, he or she was said to have joined the great majority, they'd say. Um, and also the mentality um, of a past society is likely to be very different um, from our own, even if they happen to speak the same language as us. And that can be very alluring to imagine, oh, you know, I speak English, that's English, the words mean the same sorts of thing, they think the same way. We know, as historians, that's not how it happens. In a society such as ours, where few people are closely familiar with the Bible or with the classics, how can we fully convey the mentality that, say, someone like Charles Bean, who many of you will have taught, I've seen you taught Charles Bean, you'll taught your students about Charles Bean, um, uh, you know, clearly steeped in both the Bible and especially the classics, how can we understand the, um, you know, what he brought, the mentality, if you like, he brought to an understanding of Gallipoli, the Anzacs and the Diggers? Um, if he thought of young federated Australia as a new Athens, as he did, um, what can that possibly mean to someone who's never heard of Solon or Pericles, Marathon or Salamis? So to return to my relatives, what are the contexts, apart from curiosity about my genealogy, that might make that kind of episode meaningful in historical terms. One, I think, is that it reveals something of Australia's relations with Japan in the 1930s. Um, trade with that country was on plenty of Australian minds at that time. From December 1931 to April 1932, the historian ACV Melbourne visited Asia, including Japan, on a fact-finding mission for the Queensland Government and he subsequently made recommendations to the federal government about how trade with the East, as it was called then, could be expanded. And in the year following my relative's visit, the Lions government sent to Japan a goodwill mission led by John Latham, the Attorney General of the day. Australian trade with Japan, in fact, developed very rapidly during the 1930s, interrupted really only by the trade diversion policy of the Lions government in 1936, which sought to redirect trade back to Britain. But still, um, there was a fairly steady growth with that blip of trade with Japan during that period. So there's one context, if you like, for my relatives. Here's another one. Tony and Bob Bongiorno were born in the Aeolian Islands, um, a, a group of uh, seven volcanic islands off the coast of Sicily. The islands have been exploited for their obsidian, pumice and other uh, volcanic products, but they also contain orchards, market gardens and small farms on which the islanders uh, have in the past and still graze animals. Many of the local men made a living from the merchant marine um, for at least part of the year, but the opportunities um, in coastal shipping dried up with the development of rail and steamships. Fishing is another important economic activity. But tourism, a uh, long a factor in the local economy, not least because of the supposed healing properties of mud baths and hot springs, um, that now seems to overwhelm all. In summer, in particular, the islands are flooded with visitors from Italy and elsewhere. In the past, the islands were used by the fascists to keep troublemakers at a distance and by the modern it Italian state to place uh, to exile uh, mafia bosses. The film Il Postino, which some of you might have seen back from the mid-90s, featuring the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, is set on Selena, which is one of the Aeolian Islands, in fact, the one that my father's family comes from. Homer's Odysseus was an earlier visitor 
In his travels, he, found, he once found himself on the Aeolian Island, a floating island, the whole enclosed by a rampart of bronze, not to be broken, and the sheer of the cliff runs upward to it. There, King Aeolus, a favourite of the gods, lived with his wife and 12 children. Conveniently, these were six sons and six daughters, so, of course, he bestowed his daughters on his sons to be their consorts. Together, they all feasted and lived happily. Aeolus treated Odysseus and his men with great hospitality for a whole month, and when they wanted to leave, the king gave Odysseus a bag containing all the winds and helpfully set it up so that the west wind would take them home. And I won't have any quips about that not being the, the last bag of wind to emerge from those islands. Um, ten days after they sailed, they came into sight of, the of their own land, um, but a sweet slip came across Odysseus. Doesn't it always happen in Homeric poetry? Um, the men assumed the bag contained gold and silver, and so opened it to get their share. At that point, of course, the ship was blown back to the island and an angry Aeolus, assuming that Odysseus and his men were not favoured by the gods, sent them packing without further assistance. Now, the Aeolians have been um, emigrating to Australia and the United States, as well as other places around the world, South America as well, since the 19th century. Um, my father's family were pre-World War I immigrants. The Melbourne Aeolian Club, still in existence in Ligon Street, uh, was established in 1925 and, according to its historian, was, and I quote, one of the first Italian associations established in Melbourne and the first founded upon a regional basis. In his book Italy and the Wider World, 1860 to 1960, Richard Bosworth has called the Ot Italian diaspora more generally the empire of the Italies. And he comments that for many Italians, and I'm quoting from him here, the more obvious and decisive frontiers were not located in a printed atlas, but wherever their minds or custom advised. Historians of Irish immigration, of course, have had similar things to say about them, as have historians of the so-called British world. The imperial ambitions and efforts of official Italy, which saw them uh, establish a, a short-lived empire in Africa, uh, according to Bosworth, a rather pathetic business that had very little lasting effect um, you know, in comparison with this more informal empire created by these migrants across the world, which he calls the real Italy. It's been central to the Italian experience over the last century and a half. Perhaps 20 million Italians emigrated between 1860 and 1940, and of course I'm a product of that emigration. Now, this kind of mobility of Italians across the world, including Aeolians, I think, helps place my uh, forebears' visit to Japan in perspective. It was a familiar experience for people such as this to hop on a boat and travel elsewhere, even if it was just across to the mainland or to Sicily, uh, in search of livelihoods and opportunities. What I'm suggesting today is that this is one way we can make Australian history global. We can do it through the experiences of migration and mobility that have been a part of the family experience of virtually everyone who lives in this country, even if it's internal migration within Australia, whether it's Torres Strait Islanders, for instance, moving to Cairns or Townsville, Aboriginal people in Redfern, Chinese in Sunnybank, South Africans in uh, Mindari, over in Perth, Vietnamese in Cabramatta, or Italians in Bulleen. And we now increasingly, of course, have the technologies, as I've already suggested, to enable our students to trace such histories with relative ease, or at least with greater ease than a generation ago, although, of course, they need our guidance for that sense of context that I've been talking about. So what I'm advocating here is something quite different from the contribution history that's been, I think, widely criticised and was a part of early multiculturalism in Australia back in the 1970s and 80s. Some of you can probably recall those book books published for children and teenagers with titles such as The Poles in Australia, you know, the, the Italians in Australia and so on. Um, I'm not suggesting we should, you know, look for Italians and Greeks on the first flit. Um, I'm rather advocating a history that might speak to globalism and mobility, or at least to the ambition of mobility that I think so many of our students in schools and universities have today. 
I think probably few of our students now see their whole future as lying within Australia itself. <coughs> for my own generation, and for the baby boomers a bit older than us, um, Australian history had about it a novelty that I think is now quite hard to capture. I suspect my earliest exposure, if not at Sovereign Hill in Ballarat, came with uh, a series called Australia's Heritage. Does anyone remember these? Yeah, you pick them up at the news agents, they were great. I was looking for pictures on the web, and I thought, oh, maybe I'll find a couple of covers, and look what I found. I found a coffee table, fantastic. Um, anyway, uh, Australia's Heritage, you bought them one part at a time at the news agent, eventually creating from them a bound set, which kind of had the appearance of uh, an encyclopaedia with all, all the authority that that's meant to carry. Um, I don't think I ever actually managed to collect a lot, and I suspect that was quite a common experience, but they did stimulate my interest. When I first encountered Australian history at school, and I think that was in grade three, we used to call them grades back then, in 1977, um, I can only recall that you know, there was some mention of Captain Cook, but nothing much else. Um, Henry Reynolds was yet to publish Other Side of the Frontier. Um, the ink was barely dry on the first wave of women's histories really came out of the mid-1970s. And when people refer to the bicentenary, they, of course, uh, usually meant that of Cook and 1770 and uh, not the you know, Arthur Philip First Fleet glossy celebration of a nation um, that was yet to come in 1988, along with the Aboriginal message that white Australia had a black history. Manning Clark was not just the most famous historian in the country, he was among its most famous celebrities of any kind, although I doubt I'd heard of him at the age of eight. He's more interested in Carlton, football club, that is. Um, historians were increasingly uh, the public intellectuals to which the media turned for commentary on the present, not just the past. There seemed to be virtually no topic on which you could not dig up a historian with something to say, sensible or otherwise. Um, in the 1980s, Geoffrey Blaney claimed that as a historian he was qualified to provide media commentary on Asian immigration. He thought there was too much of it. And in the early 1990s, I once heard Manning Clark being interviewed about the first Gulf War. Um, it was hard not to wonder what Clark knew about Iraq, Kuwait, oil, the Middle East and international affairs that one couldn't really just as readily pick up down at the local pub or bowling club or something. But nonetheless, there he was on the radio. Um, it might be doubtful whether the thoughts shared by such historians was always a good thing for public debate, but they did illustrate the authority of history and historians in the public sphere at that time. Um, and moreover, these were specifically historians of Australia. There was a novelty about what authors such as Anne Summers, Miriam Dixon, Robert Hughes, Reynolds, Clark, Blaney had to say, a sense that they were filling in a kind of blank space, um, not only in historical scholarship, but also, I think, in terms of some wider national identity. The 1970s, after all, were a post-imperial era in which Australia had ceased to be British, and historians assume the role of kind of national storytellers. They tell Australians what had truly been um, that is, what, they, you know, what was different in the past from what they'd been taught at school, um, what they were now, and as giving them a sense also of what they might become. And in this guise, the historian seemed as much a prophet as a, as a scholar. And it was a very flattering role, so flattering perhaps that not a few let it go to their heads, claiming more for Australian history, or perhaps history more generally, than it could actually deliver to public debate. Geoffrey Blaney, um, these days acclaimed as, by Andrew Bolt as our greatest historian, um, drew on the deep well of his knowledge of Australian history to declare in 1987 that Joe Bjocky Peterson's chances of becoming Prime Minister looked pretty good to him. He was, and I quote, one of the quiet giants of our political history. Uh, he compared the Queensland Premier with the legendary tortoise racing the hare. I think he will be a more serious challenger than most media people are suggesting, Blaney added. Needless to say, he wasn't. Um, and uh, historians, uh, no less than other people perhaps, um, uh, especially when you know, they sort of get into the wishful thinking thing, are better with the past than the future. Unsurprisingly, in these circumstances, Australian history flourished in schools and universities. 
We should resist the idea, I think, that this was a golden age, though, when students sat wide-eyed and open-mouthed and sort of hung on every word of their teachers and their lecturers. Um, Anna Clark, I think, reminds us that it actually was otherwise when she quotes a student from a 1975 survey taken in Victoria. And I quote these immortal words. We wasted too much time learning Australian history about which there is very little of interest to learn. It is time we face this fact instead of trying to pretend that Australia has had a very interesting history. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's notable that in 1972 in Victoria, 42% of Year 12 students took Australian history compared with just 6% around 20 years later. Of course, the number of students completing Year 12 had grown massively during the, the 1980s and early 1990s, um, and no doubt there were many more options available to students by that time, options including history to select from. Still, the numbers, I think, do reflect a broader shift in the standing of the subject, and indeed of Australian studies in general. It was great to, um, both to hear Paul talking about the Australian Studies Institute at the ANU, but more generally, I think, the work Paul's doing to reconfigure and reinvent Australian studies for the present. Because I think you could argue that by the 1990s and perhaps early 2000s, um, Australian studies had come to be seen by many students, and I'm borrowing a term from Richard White here, as a bit daggy. Um, when Anna Clark interviewed school kids of her book, History's Children, a book published back in 2008, she found that, and I'm quoting, for every student who enjoyed Australian history, there were many more who really disliked it. Now, as I'm sure all of you would be aware, there's no shortage of expert commentators, I use the term loosely, uh, with theories about why uh, history, and Australian history in particular, might not be appealing to as many students as we'd like. The most shallow of them, and the most ideologically motivated, complain of politically correct teaching, as if it were a dose of, uh, you know, Sir Henry Parks and Sir Robert Menzies would do the trick. Um, one of Anna Clark's findings did, however, catch my eye. She found that amid much uh, student negativity about Australian history, Anzac had acquired or perhaps regained a significant allure. I'd be interested in whether that accords with your own experiences of teaching. She examines a number of reasons for its apparent popularity, but one was that many students enjoyed studying Australians at war because of the possibility of a broader historical lens. Um, I'm quoting from her there. It was about Australians in the world, not simply at home. Just as so many of our students, I think, see a future for themselves in a world that's not bound by the Pacific, Indian and Southern Oceans and the Arafura Sea. Again, I quote from Clark, students are genuinely interested in Australians, uh, sorry, Australia's <laughs> place in the world and war history offers a global perspective on the nation's past. So perhaps we should simply give up and teach about nothing but war. One solution. Uh, I occasionally worry about my own school of history at the ANU. We have courses on World War I, World War II, War and Society, Anzac, the Cold War, the Nazis. Students can now travel to Gallipoli, France, Belgium and London for a couple of weeks studying the First World War. Lucky them. Lucky if I got to go to Geelong when I was a student. Um, they can look at the Vietnam War uh, in a course. In fact, I think we have a couple of courses on the 1960s. And if students feel that's not enough, they can always pick up a course in another college of the university on the Pacific War to say nothing of the fair on the ancient world available over in classics. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of that. Um, but I feel a question worth asking amidst all this is how might we reveal Australians moving in that wider world when they're not wearing a slouch hat um, or a nurse's uniform? Um, how have global changes largely unconnected with war transformed Australian lives? Is it possible to teach an Australian history that keeps Australia in view but is genuinely global? So I guess my own sort of recent reflections on this sort of topic have tended to, to focus on the 1980s um, which was the subject of the most, um, the most recent book that I produced. Um, and what I was, I was struck by um, when I considered how to explore the transformations of those years was the extent to which that Australian story needed to be told 
in a kind of global context and with reference certainly to Australians going out into the world but also, of course, the world coming to Australia. Popular culture, I think, was an obvious field, an obvious way to do that. Um, Crocodile Dundee, I found this... I've never seen this before. Uh, this is the film poster for Poland, for Crocodile Dundee, over on the, on the left. Um, so Crocodile Dundee, or, or Neighbours, um, tell us about how Australians like to present themselves during this period, but also, I think, how the world like to think of Australians, um, you know, given the popularity of these particular cultural products. What about the popular music of that era? What kind of relationship to globalisation does the success of a group such as um, In Excess register, I think, or I ask? Um, their song, Original Sin, apparently had its inspiration in observation of American, not Australian, race relations. Um, how might we compare them to, say, Midnight Oil on their album Diesel and Dust from 1987, where the engagement with the dilemmas of race relations in Australia are very much front and centre? What does Australia's bicentenary look like if we play Celebration of a Nation? No doubt you remember it. If you don't, just go into YouTube. Um, uh, what happens when we place that alongside, say, Beds Are Burning from uh, this, basically the same year, the same year, and that Midnight Oil album? If we want to understand the protest and social movements of the 1980s, their concerns about nuclear war, uh, the environment, justice for Indigenous people, then we could do much worse, I think, than tell us that, that kind of story through popular culture. And again, with YouTube in particular, we have ready access to that. Um, possibly many of you already do this. Um, students would learn something about Aboriginal politics too, including its transnational character, by taking a closer look at something like you know, the reggae-influenced song of the early 1980s, We Have Survived, by the Adelaide Aboriginal group no fixed address. Again, all these sorts of things are readily available now online. And what of the impact of global change on Australian lives? Here, for instance, I think we have a story to tell about technology. Can we use the objects, or at least images of them, to explain to students the impact of new technologies in the age before the internet? Do they know how a fax machine worked and why, in its time, it was such a revolutionary technology as it was, which was one of my surprise findings in the 1980s. There'd be one on every desk, it was predicted, even as you'd have um, you know, articles on the other side of the page announcing that email had arrived. Very funny. Um, do they understand that a really good computer, that's an Apple Lisa, um, uh, could cost you know, about as much as a car at the time, and cars didn't come cheap. Um, do you have an old one? You probably won't have an old one of then, unless you were very wealthy back in the early 1980s. But you know, do we have some of these sitting in our garages, collecting dust? Could they be used in teaching? Do our students uh, understand that credit cards, ATMs, have not always been with us, and that like everything else, they have a history, and that appreciating that history is actually a part of understanding how Australian lives have changed since the 1970s. Growth of personal credit, for instance, in the 1980s was absolutely massive. These are 1980s stories, but the same questions, I think, can apply to other areas. In recent years, I've found myself teaching first year Australian economic history to students at the ANU, many of whom are studying business and economics and not history. I joked to them that I bet you when you enrolled in your Bachelor of Economics you didn't think that you'd be getting a lecture on Wales, but um, that's what they get. Um, how do I convey, in the course of, of just 12 weeks, the changing shape of the economy from earliest times, indigenous, classical indigenous society, to the present? and in a way that locates Australia in the wider world. Some things are obvious. The production of Australian wool, the dispossession of Indigenous people are directly related to the demands of Bradford's woolen mills uh, and to the exploding population of the Industrial Revolution. But I have to do more. I have to show that in those early years of Australian colonisation, Australia was a part of a commercial world that, collected, that, that connected, for instance, Sydney to Calcutta, as much as to London. When we come to the gold rushes, um, you know, I need to be able to explain why gold mattered for world trade. This isn't just a parochial 
local story. The movement of migrants to and sometimes away from Australia eventually was part of a much wider crisscrossing of the globe in search of gold by British, European, American and Chinese people. Um, moreover, the rapid population growth of Australia during that period, the 1850s, much more, uh, much more rapid than uh, the growth of the last several years, which we regard as quite rapid. Um, all of this uh, a result of these migrations, particularly British and Irish, this was part of a much wider phenomenon that's been called by James Balich explosive colonisation, you know, a secular revolution that resulted in the creation of wealthy, powerful and populous British societies and English-speaking societies around the world. In short, the gold rushes of the 19th century were a global phenomenon. Um, when I seek to explain how and why these Australian colonies um, subsequently industrialised, I need to be able to show how this changed Australia's relationship to the rest of the world, how it's a key context for the massive transformation of Australia by non-European immigration in the aftermath of the Second World War. Industrialisation ne was a necessary condition for that absolutely transformative social experience. I need to explain why Australia, or industrial Australia proved unsustainable in the long term in the face of globalisation. Why the students who leave our classrooms are unlikely ever to work in a steel factory, will certainly never um, buy a new Australian made car and will work, wear shirts that are made in China and not at a Palaco factory in Richmond in Victoria. And perhaps most challengingly of all, if we're interested in mentalities, how people see the world, we need to help them understand why, unlike their parents and, and their grandparents, they probably don't care that Australia doesn't make these things. Okay? Their own consciousness has been transformed by these economic changes. And there are stories, I think, that can help um, me and others to relate this kind of history, this kind of transformation. Let me return to the one I raised earlier, the links between Australia and India in the earliest years of European settlement. It gave rise to a dramatic tale of shipwreck in 1797, a story told superbly by Mark McKenna in From the Edge, Australia's Lost Histories, which appeared a couple of years ago. When the Sydney Cove, a ship laden with goods from Calcutta, sent by the merchant Robert Campbell, and bound for Sydney, for Port Jackson was wrecked in a wild storm as it made its way across Bass Strait, the survivors arrived on an island. Having salvaged as much of their cargo as they could, they sent some men in a longboat to seek help. But the boat, that boat itself was also wrecked, and the men had to begin an arduous journey to Sydney by foot. Few of those who set out survived the gruelling walk along the coast, but those who did were indebted to the help they received from <laughs> Aboriginal people along the way. Eventually, the three men who could continue the 700 kilometre walk, the 700 kilometre journey, were rescued by a fishing boat not far from Sydney. Now, McKenna uses this micro history, and I, I don't do it justice in a summary like that, to tell a larger story about relations between white settlers and Indigenous people. One that he shows can actually speak to the dilemmas of the present. But the story is also one of Australian connection with Asia, at a time when those connections are once again strengthening. A story such as this one permits students to see Australia and India as having a shared history from the very earliest years of settlement, and not just one that's manifest in the appearance of Indian students in you know, universities down in Melbourne in the present. And what are the economics of the 1980s, to return to my own topic, that quintessential period of globalisation, the decade in which Donald Trump first came to the attention of many of us? How does one capture the speculative, risk-taking spirit of those times via a story that connects Australia to the world beyond it? Perhaps via a fraudster, not Trump in this case, but Friedrich Johann Hohenberger who appears in my own work. He's an almost forgotten figure, but for a little while there, at the end of the 1980s, he was hard to avoid. A German by birth, although he later lied that he'd been born in South Australia, he was in fact a very skilled liar. In December 1974, he was working for a road maintenance company in Munich, 
when it was discovered that he'd defrauded it of 300,000 Deutschmarks. Hohenberger disappeared before police could apprehend him, giving the impression that he'd committed suicide or been killed in a skiing accident. On the 20th of January 1975, a man calling himself Friedrich Johann Hohenberger arrived at Melbourne Airport on a flight from Auckland. Although booked to fly on to London, Hohenberger almost certainly remained in Australia. Now calling himself John Friedrich, he took up a job on an Aboriginal settlement in South Australia. Having married a nurse there, in the following year he talked his way into an appointment as a safety engineer at the National Safety Council of Victoria, a non-profit body funded, uh, founded, I should say, back in the 1920s to prevent road and industrial accidents. He became its director in 1982, living near the organisation's base in Gippsland. Fredo, as he was known, was an immensely hard-working, if autocratic, leader, but he won widespread respect as he transformed the organisation into a sophisticated search and rescue body by fraudulently borrowing hundreds of millions of dollars. My favourite here, using empty crates as security. So he'd show people one crate, which would have this you know, really expensive equipment in it, he'd show the bankers that, and would imply that all of the other crates had similarly expensive equipment, and he'd use that as security to borrow his next 50 million. Organised on paramilitary lines, the National Safety Council boasted a fleet of helicopters, fixed-wing planes, a 42-metre flagship, uh, a midget submarine, decompression chambers and an infrared scanner. Pigeons were being trained to assist with rescue missions and dogs to be parachuted with their handlers into remote areas to look for missing people. It was an outfit that seemed to possess every imaginable contraption that was expensive, shiny and new. Meanwhile, Friedrich gained the admiration of gullible politicians, there's never any shortage of them, and powerful clients in Australia and abroad who swore by his brilliance. His staff grew from 100 to 450 in just five years, most of them, of course, being paid with loans. When the organisation's chairman eventually asked Friedrich to explain some, anom some anomalies in the finances, uh, he disappeared. Um, the police eventually caught up with him in Perth. Remember, I was sitting in the cafeteria at Melbourne University and there was all this commotion in the corner and there was a student with a John Friedrich mask going like this, which I thought was very funny. This is when, when he was still on the run and hadn't been caught. Um, so the National Safety Council's debts were about a quarter of a billion dollars. This is 1989 values. Um, he was released on bail in May 1989 and two years later committed suicide near his home by shooting himself in the head shortly before he was due to stand trial. <coughs> now, what might a story such as that tell a student of Australian history? It's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> they would learn that even in the 1970s, as had been the case in the colonial era, people escaping what I'll euphemistically call difficulties uh, in other places could travel to Australia, give themselves a makeover and build a new life, including as a fraudster. Students might learn that people's backgrounds were less liable to tracing and scrutiny in the age before computer technology. Couldn't get away with this sort of thing today. People would be on the web looking for you immediately. Um, uh, th there was no easy way an employer could uh, find out about a fraud committed in West Germany. They'd learned that there was an exuberant spirit among bankers in the 1980s, the same impulse that prompted them to fall over one another to hand over cash to John Friedrich, of course, uh, was the same spirit that led them to support Alan Bond, Christopher Scase and many others. They might even learn larger lessons about life, about the dangers posed by charismatic driven men addicted to dishonesty and power, about the suggestibility of the high and mighty in the face of the trappings of success and about the importance of accountability, probity and ethics. If history can't offer those lessons, it must be doubtful whether it's worth teaching, because most of our students won't become historians. They probably will, many of them, go into jobs where they'll have to manage people and resources and do so in an ethical way. So to that extent, a historical education, I think, still does have some kind of exemplary role. And finally, and I'll finish on this note, our students are also citizens. Um, I recently agreed 
to read the proofs of Claire Wright's latest book, maybe it's just, I think it's just out, so it might even be for sale by now, um, in which she revisits the women's suffrage campaigns of the you know, late 19th, early 20th centuries. Um, and she asked me to write one of those endorsements that you know, usually appear on the covers of such books. When you daughters of freedom, the Australians who won the vote and inspired the world, arrived in my mailbox, the first thing I noticed is that the book was about 500 pages long. How, I wondered, had Claire managed to spin out the tale of women's suffrage in Australia to that kind of length? And, of course, the answer is that she hadn't. What's notable about her story is the way she traces the lives of a number of Australian women who became involved, quite centrally involved, in one way or another, in the British women's suffrage movement. She also traces some activities in the United States. It's a remarkable and, I think, little-known story, even among professional historians. And that's my period. I deal with it. I wrote a PhD on this period, and I certainly didn't know uh, about these figures. And I think it reveals that Australians, in this case Australian women, um, it, it shows them making their presence felt in the world beyond Australia's shores. Can it be that a history of this kind, told in an accessible way by a first-class storyteller, might engage the interests of young women, in particular, in the age of Me Too? Unless we try, we're not going to find out. Thank you. So, yeah, I'm happy to take questions or comments. I'd be very interested in any, I mean, particularly your experiences of teaching some of those subjects. I mean, does ANZAC, for instance, engage the interests of your students more than other topics? Are there particular aspects of Australian history that uh, are attracting the interests of your students? Yeah? Thank you, Frank. Yeah, I, when you said that, I noticed it. That's interesting. And does that is your sense of that ability, that reenactment aspect is very important to their interest in it, their capacity to do that? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just going to make a comment on the end. Um, what I do find is that it tends to be that emphasis on ANZAC, which is all the basic like, companies and dealing with ANZAC in terms of very different proposition. You don't do much about it in the schools. Yeah. It doesn't have that same almost jingoistic rah rah thing about it. And probably the most telling comment of all the year nine boys, and not so long ago, it seems to be, what do you mean we lost? <laughs> and he's learned something. <laughs> you know, yeah. well, he's, he's doing all this time and going, God, all about this and what happens, but we lost, so why? You know, why did we look at it? Yeah. Which involves another story. Yeah, but it's it's a, it's a student thinking historically, isn't it? Um, which is so you're kind of half the way there. In a way, he's he's done better than Alan Bond, who you know when Australia was you know down in the America's Cup series in 1983, said we've got to turn this around and triumph like the Australians did at Gallipoli. <laughs> we obviously. Won. I think there was another question yeah, over was here. Yeah. Comments here. Yeah. Um, just talking about putting Australia through into a global context, like you mentioned. From my experience, unfortunately, for some topics, the only way to make it interesting is by making it global. So um, I've always found that the Indigenous civil rights movement is very yeah. hard to sell to a lot of students. Yeah. But by tying into the US civil rights movement, which I find fascinating, and then looking at the influence that's had on the Australian civil rights movement, yeah. that's kind of what looks to it. Yeah. It's hard to do it independently. That's great. And, and yeah, I mean, the, the example I used there of, uh, of We Have Survived, for instance, uh, is, is a good example of that. You know, um, uh, Bob Marley came to Australia in 1979. It's clear that that, you know, is, is part of the influence for the, the, um, the, the I guess you'd call it the Indigenous uh, popular music revival or development during the 1970s that eventually leads to Yothu Indy and so on. Um, that story can also be told, you know, going well back before the 1950s and 60s. I mean, we have really interesting work now by John Maynard, for instance, which shows that, um, you know, those connections with the United States um, amongst 
uh, Indigenous activists in Australia go right back to the early 20th century. Um, they were meeting, there were Aboriginal people meeting Jack Johnson, for instance, the boxer, when he came to Australia in 1907, 1908, around then. Um, and, and his photographs, and, and he's making connection with some early organisations that involved Indigenous people in Australia, as well as other coloured people, as they called themselves at the time, often visiting sailors from the Caribbean or the United States. So there's a really deep history, I think, there that, that um, you know, we don't... And you have a much better sense of me that, of, of what will interest your students, but I think making those connections is, is an incredibly valuable thing to do, and it's, it's where the historiography, I think, has gone more generally in, in Australia in the last, uh, certainly the last 15 or 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.